quite excited to be here with uh, Patty Boyers and Catherine Freund. Um, we're going to be talking about mobility in rural areas today and some unique ideas on how to make that happen. Uh, our friend Michael Senna, uh, who writes The Dispatcher, recently said something like 40% of rural communities in the United States have no public transit services whatsoever. And that's that's a huge issue, especially if you're a senior, if you don't have access to a car, you have mobility issues. So those are some of the things we'll be exploring with uh, Patty and Catherine, and we'll be exploring Catherine's uh, uh, product, uh, ITN Country, and how that evolved. Um, first, we'll talk to Patty, but before we do that, um, I want to uh, you know do a shout out here to the t-shirt I'm wearing. Um, it's courtesy of uh, Dr. Kornhauser and the Smart Driving Car Summit. And it's important because first off, that's how Catherine and I met. And secondly, um, Dr. Kornhauser is trying to do something similar in many ways with his project, Trenton Moves, where he's trying to bring autonomous mobility to the people of Trenton because it's a real issue there. You know, 70 percent of the people have only access to one car or no cars. And so in one sense, it's, it's kind of a similar problem. The solutions may be different at how you get there, but uh, I, I think it ties in very well. So uh, thanks again, Alan, for the T-shirt, and I'm proudly here. Um, so with that, I'd like to get started with Patty because Patty, and I'm going to pull up some slides here, hopefully. Uh, Patty, I've known her for a, a while, um, thanks to uh, her work, a volunteer work, I might add, with the uh, American uh, Cable Association. And uh, she is chair of that association. And I'm pulling up some slides here because um, you, you just uh, got to see some pictures of how Patty lives. First off, she is uh, a co-founder of a company called Boycom. Uh, it's in rural Missouri. And uh, I will let her talk to some of these slides in a moment, but I'll just quickly go through them. A picture of a parking lot with your trucks. And, and the famous uh, Boyarosa, I believe I said that right. Uh, uh, beautiful expanse. So I think that road also says something about the topic we'll be talking about today. Um, and, and Patty, besides being a telecom giant, is also a farm, a farm girl, if I, if I can say that. Uh, so some images. And, and you have your girls. Uh, they look pretty cold right there. And I guess you have some other, uh, other family members as well. So with that, Patty, uh, with that introduction, why don't you kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you guys came into the tail, uh, cable business and, and the area you serve and why you serve it. Well, Ken, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I'm always game to get the opportunity to tell our story with uh, not just my story uh, with Boycom, but ACA's story and the 700 members companies that are much to, are much like us across the country. Um, you know, the ACAC, which is America, we changed our name again, American Communications Association, and we call our, our acronym is ACA Connects. And so we um, represent, like I said, companies just like mine, who really have no voice uh, in, in federal politics, but the federal politics are in our business. And so we, uh, we banded together almost 30 years ago to give ourselves uh, to try to develop some kind of a leverage, and, and we have done that. Uh, one of the things in our mission statement is that we are the uh, thought leader on the Hill for the issues, the specific issues that are relative to rural provision of initially cable TV and then uh, uh, as we rolled into it, broadband is dominating uh, the biggest part of what our uh, companies provide. And so where I provide those services at, it's in Southeast Missouri. We, we provide uh, uh, cable TV still uh, and uh, broadband phone uh, services to about, you know, four or 5,000 people in a five county area in southeast Missouri. Now, we're not right in the boot hill, but we are right before you dip down into that boot hill. And uh, in four of the five counties <clears throat> that we provide service in are in perpetually, in perpetually impoverished, which is a designation based on the census. 
and uh, those counties, those four of those five counties uh, have, you know, received that notorious um, designation because they're a modern, uh, they're mid to modern income annually for a home is below the poverty level since the 1960 census. So we have some, we have some true challenges. You know, we have the Ozark National Scenic Riverways, all three of them in our area. We also have the Marchway National uh, Forest in our area. So you have to work with that federal agency and, uh, you know, just a whole host of other logistic and uh, geographic problems, uh, you know, sparsely, sparse population. Uh, you know, we have pet population that is shrinking in some areas. Uh, in some areas, because of broadband, they're growing. Folks have learned that they can go to the house and work from just about anywhere, but they can't do that without broadband. And that's just like uh, uh, Catherine's business is that, you know, you can't get to the doctor if you don't have a car, if you live in the sticks. So I, I understand and appreciate what she's attempting and doing and thriving at. And uh, I look forward to, to sharing with y'all. And yeah, we do raise cattle. That's a subsidizes our, our broadband business. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. I rearranged your uh, presentation just slightly, um, uh, Catherine, because you know that that saying, I think it was by Covey about start with the beginning in mind. Um, there was, uh, I, I noticed the final slide on your presentation um, had uh, a very, uh, well, has your summary, your kind of your bio. And I, I did not realize um, how acclaimed you are. And hopefully, are, are you seeing the slide there, everyone? Okay. So uh, the, one of 12 people are changing your retirement, presidential appointee, advisory committee for the White House Conference on Aging, AAA Aspire, Inspire Award honoree. So you've done some cool things. And, and before you even really start, Catherine, if you could talk a little to uh, your, and I have to unmute you, um, a little to your um, uh, you know, what, what started all the, your journey here um, way back when? And if you have to unmute, it's on the lower left. I, I thought I could unmute you. I'm unmuted now. Excellent. But um, now that you've rearranged my slides, I'm afraid I can't speak now. Oh, everyone, <laughs> every, all the others are the same. We could start with slide one. There we go. <laughs> But, but it is a, a neat journey. And at some point today, maybe we can talk to that. We don't have to right now. We can follow your slide deck. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm happy to go through the slides. And, um, you know, I think what you want me to mention is that uh, I got involved in this issue because a member of my family was involved in an accident. Um, but, you know, I think lots of people, for whatever reason, get involved in something because someone they know or love has been affected. And it, and it just, you know, it gives you a push from behind or lights a fire under you, whatever metaphor you want, but it, it just makes you get involved. And, and that's what happened with me. And I, I know many other people who, who have uh, had the same experience. Um, and that was a while ago, right? I mean, that, and that, the only reason I bring that up is because this isn't just something you've come up with yesterday. This is something that's been going on for a long time. Right. Your, your company. It is. Um, so, you know, I'll just be a little more specific. Uh, uh, I have two children and um, a son and a daughter. My son is, I've lost track. I think he's 37 or 38. Um, but when he was three years old, he was run over. Uh, and uh, thank God uh, he slipped through a little hole in the universe and he came back to us and he's fine now. He's absolutely fine. But um, the issue, which is um, mobility for our aging population or for other people with special needs is an enormous, um, barely recognized national issue. And it, it affects families in many, many, many ways. Um, I, I recently have been introduced to uh, a man, Alan Lapotten, I hope I'm saying his name properly. And, He's, he's started an organization called Trusted Riders that provides trained escorts for older people who cannot travel alone. And I, I hope he will not mind my saying that he got involved because his mother 
uh, was walking from a doctor's office to a transit vehicle and there was no one to escort her. She'd recently had surgery on her leg and she tripped and fell on a construction site, got an infection in her wound, uh, lost her leg and then lost her life mm -hmm. uh, over, over not having an escort into a vehicle. So there's, there are a lot of people in this country whose lives are affected either because they don't have transportation, they don't have the right kind of transportation, they don't have the right kind of assistance, or because they're behind the wheel and they really shouldn't be, but they're driving because they don't really feel like they have any options and they want to stay in their home. So it's, it's a big, big, big national problem. The statistic you quoted that was it 40% of the communities in this country don't have transportation. It's 45% of the population. Okay. Of this country has no, it, it's probably a different statistic. There's a whole bunch of ways. Okay. You can yeah. And I'm not certain where Michael uh, got that uh, statistic, but yeah, I, I got mine from the American public transit association. Uh, and it's kind of shocking, but if you think about it, it's a very, very big country. And if you look at where people live, 80% of the population of the United States lives in 5% of the land area. And that means that rural and low density suburban is 95% of the land area of the country and only 20% of the population. So uh, people just don't think of it in those terms. You mostly hear about what's going on in big cities, but 95% of the country is not a big city. So, uh, so let, me, let me go through these slides um, and try to do it pretty quickly. So my organization is called ITN America, and that stands for Independent Transportation Network of America. And we've been working on this issue, unmet transportation needs for uh, approximately 30 years. And we take a holistic approach. We're not just uh, supporting transportation providers with software, although we certainly do that. And I'll be talking about it in a few minutes. But we, we build the technology, and as a charitable nonprofit organization, that, that's a pretty unusual thing to do. We do that so that we can keep technology as affordable as possible for as many people as possible. Um, we also work on public policy. Uh, we have a whole training system, and I'll talk about that in a little while. We educate the public about available transportation, um, and we conduct research we gather data on all the rides that we do, uh, and we, we have a very extensive 178 field database. People who are familiar with research databases, that's, that's like a windfall. Um, and so the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uses our databases uh, to, to study mobility for older people. Next slide, please, Ken, and thank you for doing these slides for me. <laughs> so, so today, what I'm going to talk about is a new program that we are launching called ITN Country. And it is, it is low cost, it is flexible for every community, um, and it comes with training online, uh, and um, it is available to any nonprofit organization uh, and any governmental agency. So a town, a county government. Uh, I am particularly aware that county seats are often the center of all services for rural areas. And very often uh, in rural counties, they have no transit system. Uh, you know, maybe a taxi, you know, maybe a paratransit ride now and then, but really nothing for the day to day. So the original independent transportation network model that we created, which is operating today in, in many communities across the country, is a more formalized system, uh, provides service 24 seven in automobiles for any purpose. And we've done about a million 400,000 rides. Um, but, but this ITN country is a rural model that we're launching. And it is, uh, I, I would say that a couple of quick sort of elevator phrases for you is that the, the original model, which is called ITN, is a model where our brand and our name is, is part of the system. But the new ITN country model is one in which we really get behind communities. We are, we, they call themselves whatever they want. We offer all of our programs to them and they can decide for themselves what programs fit their interests, their needs, and their resources. 
Uh, so it's a, it's a program that we have designed so that uh, many, many, many communities can participate and it can be affordable and we can support them at the same time. In rural America, uh, there's so many towns that are small. One of the numbers I heard is that there are 10,000 uh, towns with a population of less than 1,000. Uh, so there's just a lot of uh, little towns that really need something to supplement driving in a car. Uh, and this, this is a way to actually make that happen uh, in the community. You can think of it as a do-it-yourself nonprofit Uber, if you want. Um, Okay, next slide, please. So uh, what, one of the important things about what we do, and this is supported with the software that we provide with the system, is we've created a lot of ways for people to access resources to help pay for rides. And we've created a number of innovative programs to help that happen. Um, it's important because the true cost of transportation is very high and people are accustomed to either you know, they use their car, which even though it sits and depreciates in their driveway, they don't count that, they don't see it. And they ride public transit when it's available and their rides are highly subsidized with taxpayer dollars. So, um, so we created a number of programs to try to access resources from the local community on a voluntary basis. We're big, big, big fans of voluntary participation. So for example, um, if you can, let's see, put your cursor next to uh, Ride and Shop Healthy Mides, Miles and Ride Services. So the, these are programs where if you, for example, shop at the local supermarket, they can set up an account and they can uh, help to pay for people's rides to their supermarket, which is, it's, you know, it's very cost effective for them. Uh, nobody's taking up space in their parking lot and they don't have to deliver food for people who can't drive. We bring the people to their door and they help to pay for part of that ride. Or healthcare providers can help to pay for rides. For example, uh, we have a ride services account with um, an organization called Regeneron Pharmaceuticals and they pay for eye care rides for people all over the country and we manage that program for them. So, so it's a way for uh, the beneficiary at the delivery end of the ride to help pay for the ride from for the person who is making that trip. Um, and that just helps to cover the cost. Um, if you go down, let's see, where's donated or traded vehicles, the next one down. Uh, most older people, when they stop driving, they still have a vehicle. And sometimes they, they actually sit behind the wheel and visit it in their driveway. Uh, it's a big loss for people when they have to stop driving. We know that. Uh, but uh, sooner or later, uh, they have to pay the insurance bill on that vehicle that they're not driving. And so we've got a program where they can trade that vehicle to help pay for their rides. And we put the equity from the vehicle into their personal transportation account. And whenever they take a ride, we debit it for them. Uh, so those are a couple of examples of different ways that we've thought of that, you know, we're really, you could say, accessing resources in plain sight that nobody thought of as a resource before. And one final one I want to mention is um, uh, transportation credits. Uh, when people volunteer to drive others, we, uh, we have a program where the organization can give them a credit for that effort. And they store that credit in their personal transportation account, which is built into the software. And then when they're older, someone else will drive them so they can kind of pay it forward. Um, you know, on, on average, people outlive their decision to stop driving by 10 years. And I don't know why nobody talks about this, because it's been established since 2002. It's called driving life expectancy. And we're all pretty much going to do it. But we're not driving to our own funerals. There's going to come a time when... We're not driving. And um, so this is a system where you can drive someone now and then someone else will drive you later. Or if there's another community on the ITN network, you can, you can drive in your community and then your loved one in another community can pull those credits out and someone else will drive them. Okay, enough of this. Next slide, please. So the community in the cloud, this is our online learning center. 
Uh, and it supports uh, communities that already have a transportation service and want to be part of the network. But I think more importantly, actually, it supports communities that have no transportation service at all. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, that's 45% of the communities in this country, 40% of the communities, 45% of the population. Um, and so we have a free um, uh, information center, a free startup tools on the community in the cloud. My, my email's at the end and people can email me if they wanna um, get online. And, and that those tools, that toolkit, helps people in a community who want to get started providing a, a volunteer service in their community, figure out all the nuts and bolts of where do we have our service area? You know, you, you have to define it somehow. Um, how far are we going to serve people? You know, what's the service area? And are we going to have paid staff or are we going to have volunteer staff? And if we do this, what kind of insurance do we need? And all those basic questions, that is free and available to the public. Once a community goes through that planning, and we'll help, help people with that, but once you go through that planning, if you are interested in um, joining the ITAN network and using that technology, um, then there's a whole other set of tools that are available to you to help you manage and run your organization. And this online learning center, which we call the community in the cloud, is linked to the technology ITN Rides 2.0, which um, we've been building technology for about 20 years. We are now moving it to the Salesforce platform. And I am uh, very pleased to say that all of our routing algorithms, which make your routing efficient, have been donated to us by Esri. And we're very grateful for that donation. Next slide, please. So these are the two kinds of communities that we can serve, communities that don't have any service or communities that have a volunteer service that um, could really use some support. There are lots of volunteer services around the country and they're primarily unsupported and they're trying to figure things out by themselves. And, um, and it, it's tough, it's a business, you know, it, it's a nonprofit business and it takes uh, a lot of work to make a business successful. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is, we're showing you our old stuff. Uh, this is 20 years old, this, this uh, software. Um, and it's done, I said a million three, it's done a million four by now. And it is uh, old desktop software that is available only to the staff, the people, the people in the office, they can see what's going on. That means everybody who wants to know any information has to call by telephone or email the staff to, to manage it. Next slide, please. This is what the new software looks like. Uh, it's prettier. Um, and it is available through a web browser. This is, this is the connection to what Patty is doing and the organizations that she's representing. You have to have broadband to access the internet and access this program. But if you do have broadband, the full system of support is available to you for your existing uh, system, or if your community wants to get a group of people together and say, we are tired of seeing old people push shopping carts through the snow to get home, and we're gonna get some rides for people, and we're gonna get together and we're gonna do it. You know, um, you can find everything you need through a web browser. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, that's an example of what a driver's manifest looks like. It has all the information that you need to serve people. You can be sure if someone is using a service uh, that there's some reason why they're not driving themselves. It may be that they can't afford the car. It may be that they just had their hip replaced. It may be that they can't see. Um, there's lots of reasons, but generally speaking, they need some assistance and all the information that a volunteer driver needs in order to properly call someone, email someone, connect with them, or, or take care of them. It's all available. It's all in the system and it's all available in the manifest. Next slide, please, Ken. So in rebuilding our software on Salesforce, we've been really careful to pay attention to people with special needs, 
so that um, anyone, even if they are colorblind or visually impaired um, or, you, or are completely blind and use a screen reader, you can read this software with uh, JAWS or any other screen reader. So it's accessible. Um, next slide, please. On the Salesforce platform, we have many, many, many layers of security. This is really important. Uh, the different features that you want in your software are security, resilience, which means you can recover from mistakes quickly or problems, needs to be accessible, affordable, easy to use, and comprehensive. And I am, I, I guess I want to say I'm proud to say we're covering these bases. We're really pleased to do that. Next slide, please. These are the four levels of security on Salesforce. Uh, that's a big deal because you're handling information for vulnerable people and you're sending people to their door. Uh, so you really want to be sure all your data are secure and they absolutely are. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, remember I said that the old software was visible to the staff, right? But ITN is, uh, ha is designed as a community-based and community-supported nonprofit effort and that means that if you have portals for all the different kinds of people and organizations that want to participate or can participate, that they can get into the technology through their web browser, through their portal. So the old software, no portals. The new software, uh, next slide, please. I think I got a picture of the portals here. There you go. The transportation staff obviously can get in. Riders their families, their caregivers. It's especially important for older people who, who need some help scheduling their rides uh, that their adult children can get on and schedule rides for them. If you have a system where you charge for rides, uh, a family members can get on and pay for people's rides for them, just pay into their account and set it up for them. Volunteers can pick up their rides through the, through the internet either volunteer or paid drivers, all the information they need. Um, and volunteers, may they may be assigned their rides or they may choose to use a system where they want to select which rides they do themselves. Both of those are, are possible through this system. And then there's a portal for businesses and healthcare providers and other community organizations that want to participate, either by helping to pay for rides or by scheduling rides. They can get in as well. So it's very open but it's also very secure. And those, those are two seems incompatible, but, but they're actually very, very important and they're all in the system. Okay, next slide, please. So I wanna mention this, um, you know, we are in the process of becoming completely digital. And in the business world, they call that the digital transformation. Uh, in our case, it adds enormous value to the system for rural communities, for small communities, uh, they can log on to the browser and they can use the ITN Country or ITN Rides software and be on the platform. But also, sometimes people just want to know what's already available. Is there anything available in my community? I need to get to the doctor in three days. Uh, so we have a website, Rides in Sight, um, and you can, you can search the database. It's free. It's available to the public. Or we've got a toll-free number, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Monday through Friday. You can call a, a trained uh, customer service representative, and they will give you custom help uh, for every single person who calls for uh, the transportation services that are available in your community based on your needs. So if you are a veteran and you want to know what veterans' rides are available, we can help you with that. If you need to be escorted in and out of the vehicle, we can tell you which services will provide that escort for you. If you are low income and you're looking for rides that are free, we will tell you which rides are free and so on and so forth. Very, very custom, which is really what you need in order to meet your transportation needs. So that's the website for that. And, and it's highlighted there for you, ridesinsight.org. Or write to me, call me, and I'll, I'll introduce you. And the last slide I want to talk about is, is the last piece in our digital transformation. So the, the three pieces I mentioned already are the ITN Ride software on Salesforce, 
um, the Rides in Sight uh, call and searchable database, the community in the cloud training system. And then I really think <laughs> that uh, we just need to change the way Americans think about and support mobility uh, for older people and for the special needs population and for communities where there is no public transportation. I mean, who knew this problem was so big, right? <laughs> I mean, really big. Uh, and, and it seems to be invisible and under the radar. So we are going to be starting something called America's Volunteer Driver Center. We'll be working with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on a public information campaign uh, to uh, help people understand the size of the problem. And this is a problem with an answer. The answer is people need to ride. And there's lots of private vehicles out there and lots of people with good hearts and good intentions. If we bring this to their attention, I think they will volunteer to drive. So we're gonna do that. Um, we're gonna bring together uh, a national advisory panel with representation from business and in industry, from uh, philanthropy in the nonprofit sector and from government at all levels. Um, we're gonna have a national information campaign. You know, I think of the Red Cross, if every community uh, got blood donations the way every community is getting volunteers to drive people who need rides, there would be no blood in the nation's hospitals. We just can't solve major national problems by inventing it over and over and again, one community at a time. So, um, so America's Volunteer Driver Center is going to be to volunteer drivers what the Red Cross is to blood donation. Um, and we're going to set up a website where anybody in the country who wants to volunteer to drive can be screened and trained, and we will match them with the available nonprofits in their area that is looking for volunteers. Um, and that's the end, I think. Oh, those are the different uh, three sectors of the economy that we're currently working with and the foundations. We are very grateful for their support and our industry. Uh, and business um, supporters and the different parts of the government we're working with. I hope I have not talked for too long. And the last slide has my email, but Ken already showed it in the beginning. So that's it. I hope that made some sense because I talked pretty fast, I think, but happy to take anybody's questions. If Yeah, that was terrific, Catherine. I think that last thing, it just, uh, since driving seems to be in people's blood, the uh, Red Cross analogy is their metaphor is probably a good one. Um, Patty, let's get some of your thoughts. I have bunches of questions, but uh, I want this to be more of a conversation and, and just, you know, some of your impressions. Well, I, when we had our uh, conference call a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, <clears throat> I was unaware of this issue. Uh, and so I did some quick research in, in my neck of the woods. And, and we do have a couple of uh, organizations that are doing much the same thing. But I've subsequently talked to some of them. How's it working? How's it going? Of course, they have the same problem, Catherine. They need drivers. They right. need vehicles. They need, um, they need resources. Right. And uh, uh, there is, for them, for here in my area, there does not seem to be any uh, loss for folks needing the service. And so this is very much a needed, uh, and you've been at it for 20 years, and I gotta say, I'm just Johnny come lately to the deal, but I can see for the upgrade in your um, your platform on your, to be web-based now, could be very advantageous, uh, not only from a bringing everybody together, but to be able to you, you're out there in, in New England, and I'm here in southeast Missouri, and you can communicate in, in real time with folks that are here. And that is based off of web-based and broadband needs. And so uh, we do have a, a centrally themed uh, uh, commonality. So, uh, you know, I, I, we do, you know, we do things for the community as well, you know, the, lower packages in some cases uh, to nursing homes and to hospice homes and to we have a, we have a pretty good sized senior population but um you know i and i i applaud you for uh this this is uh this is quite an undertaking 
you all been at it a long time, so you seem to know absolutely every nook and cranny where there's money available. And, uh, you know, Ken, I think it's a great deal. Well, that's that's good to hear because I I thought uh, I thought the same thing. But then, you know, I live in the city and and you know, in San Jose alone, there's 125,000 people over 65 years old. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of them, I know a lot of them have problems getting around. So if it's it's that big of a problem here and we don't necessarily have good solutions, uh, clearly there's, it's an issue elsewhere. One question I have, uh, you know, I, I just read a, an article uh, in AARP about uh, scamming and how, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it can happen to anyone, regardless of education, intelligence, whatever. Uh, and, and people uh, it said the one common denominator was they get people at kind of their weak times, their emotional times. And and I, you know, to your point about the security and the data, how do you make sure that you don't get some bad apples who are volunteer drivers? How do you, you know, uh, how do you prevent that? Uh, it's a good question, Ken, because because not only are we recruiting volunteers, but we are sending them to the door of vulnerable people. So um, I can speak for our affiliates or any of the organizations that are on our network, but we do a criminal history check. We do a moving violation check. We check their vehicle. If they're in a state with inspection stickers like Maine, we make sure their inspection sticker is current. We make sure their insurance is in place and their license is current. And we provide training for them for, and actually right now we're shooting the videos for the Community in the Cloud online training center so that we can show people, this is how you escort a person with visual impairment. And this is how you fold a wheelchair. And this is how you help a frail older person so that you are helping them, not imposing on them. You know, you have to be thoughtful and respectful about how you offer assistance. So we, we, we look at the safety issues from many different perspectives. I mean, we wanna provide safe mobility for people. So it's different. Uh, then maybe I'm speaking out of turn here, but you know, I, I think it's much more careful and thoughtful than any of the paid services I know of. Um, I don't want to be unfair to anybody, but we, we're just really careful. My, my standard here was, if, is this person safe enough to drive my mother? Um, mm. and, and if they are, then they can drive someone else's mother. You know? That makes sense. Hmm. Well, we're on the topic of insurance, and Patty, jump in at any point. But uh, uh, what I know we've had this discussion before. But different states have different policies, literally policies for for what a volunteer has to do in terms of insurance. Do you want to talk to that for a moment, just in general? Me? Well, I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> unless Patty wants to talk about it. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm interested. Well, I mean, it's usually the first question everybody asks insurance. Um, and insurance is not federally regulated. It is regulated by state legislatures. So it's, it's a little bit different in almost every state. Um, and um, I, I would recommend to people that they contact not their agent, but look for the policies of the insurance company. In, in, and that's because agents are sometimes just not that well informed. They'll say, oh, volunteer, you know, this doesn't cover you. Your, your personal insurance doesn't cover you. But uh, in fact, um, it does. It does cover you. Uh, in Maine, there is a policy passed by the state legislature in 1995 that says that an insurance company may not unreasonably or unfairly deny you coverage or increase your premium because you use your vehicle to volunteer to drive. And, and that policy has been copied in, in many states. I, I can think of uh, Florida, Kentucky, Maryland. Um, uh, in the outskirts of Chicago, but not the entire state of Illinois. Um, and, uh, and that means you, you know, 
I like to tell people, you know, can you drive someone else? That's why your car has seats, right? You know, you, you can put someone else in your car and drive them somewhere. We all do it all the time. And, and you shouldn't be discriminated against because you're volunteering. Um, a couple of years ago, Uber and Lyft had paid lobbyists going through the country. And in three years, they changed policy in 47 states and the District of Columbia. And a lot of volunteer services were inadvertently swept up in those changes. Uh, so um, AARP has done a really nice paper on uh, uh, insurance policy and what can be done and what cannot be done. But I mean, if anybody's having trouble with their insurance, call me, I'll help you. <laughs> I'll, link, I'll link to it in the write-up. Uh, okay. Uh, from a training perspective, uh, uh, you have these videos. Are those going to be on a YouTube channel? And are those the kinds of things that I, I suppose you'll want promoted? <laughs> well, some of the videos will be in the free section of our online learning center, and some of them will be in the section for communities that have decided that they would like to be on the platform with us. Um, so, so both. Um, I can send you links to anything that's free. People will just have to contact us, and we'll give them a password, and they can get it. From an ISP perspective, Patty, um, you know, putting on your ISP hat uh, and or, you know, ACA, what are your thoughts on this as far as how this might complement what you do or vice versa, how what you do complements uh, what Catherine is doing? Well, I think every every company that I'm aware of, especially the members of uh, the ACAC, have, you know, free community uh, billboards, uh, scrolls. They'd have their own, a lot of times have their own uh, community calendars and all that kind of thing. I could see where um, some free advertising, some, you know, community public awareness kind of things about the, about the services being available. Uh, you know, we are a for-profit, so it, we, we couldn't get involved in it from the perspective of utilizing the, the grant the grants and the, the program because by by statute it has to be you know a 501 c3 and not a not for profit but we can dovetail in and, and help from a, from a broadband perspective in those actual communities just to get the word out you know um, somebody news coming in you want to get established uh, most of the time, it's not like uh, going into a small community and saying, oh, there are 12 fast food restaurants here, or there are 52 churches, or, you know, there are several schools. There's going to be pretty much one provider. you got one guy out there, Lone Wolf, that's providing in these areas because there's not a lot of uh, competition to get people in there to compete with you. Most folks don't want to be there. So um, the big guys don't for sure. And so we generally know our public officials. We know our, you know, um, regional planning and zoning commissions. We know our FEMA person, our emergency management people. We, we know all of those things. And so, you know, we could be a great resource, like a one-stop shop, just like your county commissioners uh, for, Catherine's organization as they come into a new uh, a new community. Yeah, that that makes sense, and that was kind of one of the things that uh, why well, I thought there there could be a connection because you you basically you know everyone in the community, right? I mean, and and Good your man, business, right or wrong, yeah. yeah, and your yeah. business is about connecting people, right? So, and that's Absolutely. effectively what Catherine's doing too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, we got some weird buzz in there, but uh, that's that's probably one of the ride prop for private ride share companies or something. Who knows? But, uh, <laughs> no, that that weird buzz is my furnace just kicked on. Oh, okay. Oh. I'm in Maine and I'm in a 110 year old house, and when the furnace kicks on, it sounds like the ship's engine is going. So. Oh, that's fine. At least we have an explanation puts things in context. And I think that that's maybe kind of, uh, you know, the thing I kind of want to end on or the final discussion is it seems to me that other part of this that has 
um, in a way, uh, it goes beyond just giving people rides or connecting to the internet or whatever it is. Both your organizations offer that opportunity to kind of build community or maybe strengthen community. And so maybe you both can kind of touch upon that in whatever way you want. Catherine, go ahead. No, I, I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it would be wonderful to be introduced to the local communities through the internet service provider, um, because uh, I'm sure that people uh, watch their cable TV in rural America just as much as, you know, we do in, in more urbanized America. So that's, that's a wonderful thought. Thank you very much. I, I will reach out to you. And I think, you know, from a perspective of ACAC, that gives you, you know, 600, 700 companies in little bitty places uh, all across the nation that in that 95% that you talked about, uh, that's where we're at. So, and you're right, Ken, we don't just, we're not just out there providing a cable TV service or broadband service or phone service. I mean, we have all kinds of community service. You know, we provide schools, we provide Wi-Fi hotspots. We have done uh, above and beyond in our communities because we're the only one there. And uh, and it's the right thing to do, you know? And, and this is the right thing to do, to be able to help our seniors and anyone else, anybody else is compromised, uh, low income, you know, uh, handicapped, anything anything like that that we can reach out and um, at least get um an organization catherine's organization or ones just like into those communities to provide some much needed services yeah what's really cool is catherine not only um uh in, in uh, you know talks is the owner of the product, I guess you're a nonprofit owner, but she uses the product. So Catherine, why don't you just tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you'll go at five in the morning to bring someone to a uh, uh, MRI or whatever it was. Oh, uh, I guess I still drive um, and I enjoy it. Um, volunteering to drive uh, is an incredibly personal, rewarding, experience you know you sit on the front seat next to someone you have a conversation um, and I always volunteer for the middle of the night or early morning rides I, I don't sleep well anyway so I may as well be helping somebody do something so I, I do the 5 30 a.m. dialysis rides or airport rides uh, but there's one ride I do every Sunday that they need me and it's someone who's been an ITN member for 23 years and she's really proud to tell you she's 95 i take her to church and she is the person who folds and stuffs our invoices every month and sends them out <sighs> as a volunteer uh, i will also tell you we take a 100 year old woman to work six days a week she's been riding oh my gosh and it's volunteers she goes early early in the morning she tells everybody what to do um and when the weather's nice she wears her lovely mini skirt um, <laughs> such hot stuff everybody loves to drive her so so um yeah i volunteer we have wonderful volunteers it's 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 really rewarding it really is um i know all forms of volunteering have their own rewards but but this is you know the people we drive they come out of their homes they are so happy to see somebody Sometimes people are isolated and they don't see anybody for a long, long, long time. And then the volunteer comes to their door and if they need help, helps them into the vehicle. If they go shopping, carries their packages in and puts them on the kitchen table. And um, it's good stuff. It just is good stuff. And, and this sounds corny, but it's a privilege to help people this way. It really is um, very rewarding. And, you know, I think cars are like little, little rolling living rooms, you know, they're, they got picture windows, they got music piped in, they're upholstered, they're climate controlled, and people get in and the next thing you know, you're exchanging recipes or talking about grandchildren or something like that. It's, so yeah, I do it, but I'm just one of a lot of people who do the same thing and we all love it. 
Well, it sounds like fun. It sounds like uh, a, a great thing for this country. And, you know, and the ITN country is an appropriate name for that. So, Patty, Catherine, I both appreciate your time today. Kath, uh, Patty, do you have any final comments or? Well, I just, I just want to shout out to Catherine. I bet uh, COVID was a real uh, challenge for us. I can only imagine the challenge for y'all. And and when you spoke, when you said the word isolation, that that you know clicked because we were installing we were installing broadband customers and fiber to the home through these people's windows and from from our truck in their driveway we'd lay their modems on the porch and they would come out pick up the modems go back in their house call us on our cell and we would sit there and we would we would you know walk them through a um a self install wow and so i i and, and, and so i you know i called back in you heard me say it before it was my you know pedestal uh from the pole to the pedestal to the porch policy <laughs> and you know we didn't we didn't we didn't have any face-to-face -face interaction you know our customers are all the people are busy but you know folks like to visit and they like to especially if it's a a senior citizen, maybe a widow, a widower, sitting there, uh, all they've got is that television. And, uh, or, you know, their internet, or their iPad, or whatever. And I can see where it would have impacted your business greatly, because you still got those doctors. That's the other thing we're big into is telemedicine, and, and providing the doctor visits via Wi-Fi rather than than in person because of health issues and, and because of the pandemic. How'd that affect you? Uh, well, uh, we, we lost a couple of affiliates who couldn't make it through. Um, and all of the services, with the exception of one or two, are doing fewer rides now than before the pandemic hit. Uh, but um, uh, the lion's share of our services have stayed running the kinds of rides we do are different. It's much more necessity rides, uh, food or um, healthcare appointments. But I think, you know, before COVID hit, uh, I can tell you from the data we gather through our database that the average age of people we serve are uh, is uh, about 80, and the most common age is 85. Uh, and uh, three quarters of the people nationally are women, and 62% of them live alone. Wow. So, uh, you know, nursing homes are only 5% of the over 65 population. It's mostly people living alone in their homes. And, you know, I guess if, if people listening have experienced social isolation in the last two years, um, please know that older people in this country living alone in their homes have been experiencing that for a decade or more and many more will in the future there's a lot of isolation if you can't drive anymore and i'm sure they all love their internet connection and god knows i do it's on 24 hours a day in my house but um but sooner or later it's just nice to be with a real person and connect. Um, it, it just, I know how I threw my arms around my children's necks when I finally got out <laughs> of isolation here and how important it is. So, you know, who knows where we're all going to be on the other side of this pandemic? You know, we think, I don't think it's going to go back to the way it was. Um, I think internet is going to be a whole new world uh, and essential part of everyone's life. Um, and I think work is changing, you know, more remote work. There's a lot of changes that we're all gonna live with. But the good thing is that people are people and we're gonna be back together in some form or other. And also, I wanna say, people are really good at helping each other if you give them a way to do it and make those connections, whether it's through the internet or through a transportation service. And people, people will be reconnecting again. I know I sound corny, but I don't care. 
<laughs> not corny. We, we're herd animals, you know. Uh, even there you go. <laughs> no, we are herd animals, and and we do like interaction with one another. Once we started going back into people's homes, here, of course, the state of Missouri never did have a complete shutdown, but uh, and, and the only cities that actually had mandates were Kansas City and St. Louis. So I like to tell folks, which is the truth, that we socially distance as a way of life down here. <laughs> uh, it, it is. It's not like, um, but but still, yeah. Whenever you go into a, a senior citizen's home and work on their cable, we've got our technicians. They get pie. They get, you know, can I get you a cookie? Can I do something for you? And they end up spending thirty minutes on a twenty-minute call, or thirty-five or forty minutes on a fifteen-minute call because they're having pie. But you know, that's how you build customer relations because you just, it, and it's just the right thing to do. And I, I believe, Kathy, just like you, that most folks are good and that we will find a way to, um, we will find a way to uh, still relate to one another and, and, and be good people. You're here. Yeah, that, that's a great way to end today's conversation. I, I can't agree more with uh, with that. And I've just been uh, so thrilled to have both of you on here. Um, a couple of comments in the uh, Twitter. Um, uh, we, you know, we talked a little bit about liability, um, but maybe we should address that. There's a couple of comments I missed earlier. Thank you, Lila. And uh, she says, every time this subject comes up in my work, Georgia Department of Public Health older driver safety program. The first everything, first thing everyone yells is liability. Can you talk a little, a little bit about this? Um, and we've, uh, we have talked a little bit about it, but I don't know if there's any more to say about liability. I, I've said everything, you know, I can say, you know, uh, there is insurance and, and people are covered. Um, and I, I remember when we first got started, uh, the insurance company, called and said, you know, you, you just can't be escorting these frail older people in and out of their house. You know, you just can't do that. That's too risky. Um, I, I can remember where I was sitting when it happened. And I said, really? I said, well, we will do this. I said, so you tell me what the bill is and we will get our checkbook out and we will write you a check because someone needs to escort people. So we will do that. Uh, so there is insurance. Um, everybody worries about it, and rightly so, but um, everybody can be covered. No doubt. You know, can we live in a, in a litigious society where, like she just, Lila just said, the first thing people say is liability, and then the second thing they say is sue. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's where the liability comes from, is to cover your rear end when you get sued. One thing I have learned about the insurance industry is it has grown with, morphed with, and transitioned into uh, many different kinds of coverages that probably weren't, weren't initially available when Catherine started her business. And, and, and they will, they will grow with it. They'll figure out a way to cover, and they'll come up with an actuary to tell you how much you're going to pay for it too. But they will, they will cover it. And, and there are ways of doing that, going to your state insurance boards uh, in, in your states, like right there in Georgia, you can go to the state house and there's a department of insurance uh, and, and then insurance companies can be um, compelled to cover your specific needs. Uh, their problem is the actuaries and how you figure out what that's going to be. But uh, after they get rolling, the insurance industry is, is pretty flexible. They'll roll with you if you're if you're legitimate. And it's obvious this organization is very legitimate. Well, in a million four hundred thousand rides, I do not know of one lawsuit. That's awesome. You better yeah, that's terrific. Wood, sister. <laughs> <laughs> Find you some wood right now. Knock on it. Another old man behind you. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, I just that. I just knocked on wood for you. So uh, yeah, me but, too. <laughs> but that's terrific. And again, I appreciate uh, this conversation. And uh, it, 
have continued conversations and watching that, watching the progress on this.